Hi there, my name is Adam Iverson and I'm from the University of Manchester at the UK Alma Regional Centre Node. So this is a quick and hopefully fun introduction to the Fourier transform, which is something that underpins a lot of what happens within interferometry. So an outline, uh, I'm going to first introduce the Fourier transform uh, and then look at the two-dimensional Fourier transform, which is the one most commonly used in interferometry. Have some fun transforming things that are around my house using Fourier transform. Uh, and then look at their uses within interferometry and what that means for creating images of objects in the sky. Okay, so first off, what are we talking about? Well, a Fourier transform is a mathematical transform which takes a waveform, so either a function of time or space, and transforms it to represent it as a function of frequencies, so temporal or spatial, depending on whether the input was a time or space waveform. The transformed waveform is then returned as a, a sum of sinusoidal functions of different amplitude and phases. Um, this is important as it allows you to see the components which make up your original waveform. So at the bottom here I show the uh, mathematical form of that. So for a function f of x, the Fourier transform is given at the top. And the inverse is then the, the second row of equations there, going back from the Fourier version to the original function. So to take what I just said and give a sort of tasty analogy, um, imagine you had a cake and uh, you wanted to know what was in there, what it was made out of, but you didn't have a recipe or an ingredients list. If we, if we had a hypothetical food Fourier transform, then we could take our cake, run it through a series of filters, which the transform is effectively doing to extract all the ingredients that make up that cake and the amounts of them, and that would then give us a recipe in the Fourier domain. So why would that be useful? Well, knowing the ingredients of your cake makes it easier to compare with another cake. So if you wanted to compare the one you're looking at with, uh, say, a chocolate cake, and, and then you would know the difference because there would be some different ingredients in there. And it also, it lets you know um, if you have the right ingredients to make a cake in the first place. We can also do the inverse, which would take our ingredients and uh, transform them back into a cake. So that would be the Fourier baking transform, I guess. So now we've got a, a very quick overview of what Fourier transform is. We can talk about the one used in interferometry. Um, so usually we are considering the spatial distribution of emission from, from objects in space uh, on the two-dimensional plane of the sky. And I do note on here that this is under some underlying assumptions and given some frequency bandwidth and other observing characteristics, um, but we don't need to worry about those just now. So given that we're looking at objects in a two-dimensional plane, it is important for us to consider the 2D Fourier transform. So if you have a function, a function f of x and y, then the Fourier transform of that gives you what is shown in the equation here. And if f of x and y is a function representing the sky brightness distribution, so the spatial scales upon which the emission which we're observing is distributed, then u and v in the Fourier transform are spatial frequencies. The Fourier transform, capital F of u and v, is a complex function and the real and imaginary parts can be related to amplitudes and phases and that is important as that is what we can measure with an interferometer. Okay, we've seen the maths there. We've had earlier an example of a, of a transform in terms of food. Uh, what happens if we take a, an image of a household object and do a Fourier transform? What, what information do we recover? Um, so these are two objects that are commonly found around my house at least. Um, so first we have a dog wearing glasses um, and if we take her for a transform uh, then we can look at the amplitudes and phases. So the amplitude gives us an idea of the strength of the signal that we're observing and the phase information gives us uh, information on the distribution of where that emission happens to be. Um, so in this example we can see that there is a lot of uh, emission on large scales because we have a bright point in the amplitudes 
uh, in the center of our of, of the of the middle image there uh, and because the uh, the faces don't have much structure in there it is uh, safe to say that the uh, the distribution of emission is scattered all around the hypothetical sky that contains a dog wearing glasses. Uh, similarly, if you had a, a nice foamy drink, um, then if you took the Fourier transform of that, then again we see the uh, the amplitude is is uh, showing that there is some some larger scale structure and I'm giving us some information that there are some sharp edged structures in there uh, given by the sort of the ringing you can see sort of the ripples pattern within there uh, and similarly in the phase plot as well you may be able to make out there's a slight rippling in there okay so those are the amplitudes and phases of, of some household objects and um, you can see that it's not necessarily obvious straight away what you're looking at if you just focus on those two Fourier transformed components um, but uh, that does lead us on to the following question. What is our interferometer doing? In practice, what we are doing with an interferometer is we are observing some sky. Uh, again, we've gone back to, to one of my dogs um, with, with an array of telescopes um, crudely drawn there by me. We feed the signals from each of those into a supercomputer known as a correlator. That gives us uh, information on the amplitudes and phases. We then feed that information. These are the, the visibilities that come off the telescope, we feed that information into some software and we hope to reconstruct an image of the sky. Okay, to review that again, we are uh, observing with an interferometer, uh, our detected signals are put through the correlator, the correlator output gives us recovered amplitudes and phases. However, unlike the examples I gave previously, we do not have access to all the Fourier components, all the U and Vs. Um, from the 2D Fourier transform equation. And this is because we have a finite number of antennas. So we have uh, an incomplete sampling of the UV points. So the plot here is, is a, an example from, from an ALMA simulated image. Um, we have the U points along the bottom and the V points uh, on the Y axis. Um, and you can see that there are gaps in our UV coverage here, so it's not completely filled um, and this is one of the important features of working with interferometric data and over the next few slides we'll look at the effect of this incomplete sampling of UV points. So the simplest place to start is, is to think about a single baseline, so two antennas. What do we get? So on the left we have our two dishes antennas on the on on a grid, um, they're about four kilometers apart in the geometry of this system. And at the observing frequency of these hypothetical observations, then in the middle we have our UV coverage plot. So we get two UV points from our pair of antennas, um, and you can see that uh, the U component is fairly uh, narrow. There are about sixty kilo lambda. Don't worry too much about the units just now. Um, you'll cover this further in other sessions. Um, and the V components is slightly more extended. Um, so for a single pair of antennas, our resulting image is a sinusoidal pattern, as you can see on the right. And each pair of antennas, if there were more on here, would give us a different, different uh, sinusoidal pattern. The distance between our two antennas on the left dictates the spatial frequency we are sensitive to. So that, remember, these are the U and V components of the 2D Fourier transform. So if we move our two dishes further apart, we become sensitive to smaller spatial scales, so larger spatial frequencies. Um, and you can see, so on the, on the left, we have moved our dishes to 18 kilometers apart. The U's and V points have now moved further apart on their respective axes, and the sinusoidal pattern has become a much higher frequency. So we're looking at smaller spatial scales. And again, I emphasize that if we had more pairs of antennas, then we would get more than one sinusoid. And that's something we will look at on the next slide. If you see the arrow along the top, we're increasing the number of, of dishes as we go from left to right as we're looking at it. Um, so if we, if we take the leftmost column, then we just have three antennas. And uh, that gives us uh, six UV points. Uh, and the UV plot is clearly not very well filled and our resulting image is 
basically a checkerboard pattern of uh, some horizontal and some vertical uh, sinusoidal patterns overlapping one another. And then as we move to the right, we go to five antennas. We have uh, increasingly well-filled uh, UV plane. So we've got more points in there and our image at the bottom, our reconstruction image becomes uh, the uh, overlapping of all these sinusoidal patterns. Clearly with five antennas, we're not really recovering anything uh, obvious. Uh, again, the next column along, 10 antennas. We're starting to see maybe some shape in the recovered image. Our UV plot in the middle is starting to show, it's starting to be quite well filled. And then finally on the right hand column, we can see that the UV coverage is, is, is quite well filled in the middle. Um, and we could, given that we know what the image we're looking at is, uh, we could guess that that is one of my dogs. So we've seen with the increase of number of antennas, then we can start to fill the UV plane and, and give a better reconstructed image of the sky that we are observing. Now we can use the fact that the Earth rotates to help us out further. So this is the same slide as before, except now we are observing rather than being in a single snapshot mode as it is referred to, so just one single observation, we are observing multiple times over a number of hours and each point we recover a different sampling of the UV plane and that's because if you imagine your array of antennas on the ground staring at a point in the sky as the earth rotates the orientation of the baseline so the the line between each pair of antennas changes that gives you a, a new piece of information in the Fourier domain so you get to add another pair of UV points per antenna per observation over that time period. So again, if we go from left to right, three antennas, uh, we have a lot more UV coverage after observing for, for a longer period. Um, again, nothing particularly easy to, to see in the reconstructed image. So we carry on, we add more antennas, uh, about five, perhaps, you can start to see there is some structure in there, but nothing obvious. At 10, I would say that the uh, the image is, is almost as good as 30 in snapshot mode. And then finally, if we go up to 30, our UV coverage in the middle, it's very well filled and we have quite a nice reconstruction of the, of the sky that we are viewing. Um, there are then other tricks that we could uh, use to fill in more information so we could compress some antennas very close together to let us access larger spatial scales. And similarly, we could spread them really far out to give access to smaller spatial scales. Okay, that was a whistle-stop tour of Fourier transforms and their uses within interferometry. They will be covered in more depth in other sessions and as you work through some data examples, everything should become a bit clearer. Um, but as a summary, Fourier transforms break down time or space waveforms into their component parts expressed as temporal or spatial frequencies. They act as spatial filters, so smaller Fourier frequencies give large scales and vice versa. So those relating those close antennas and those far apart antennas to the, the sinusoidal pattern that you recover. And finally, missing spatial frequency information affects our ability to recreate a true representation of the initial waveform that we are trying to reconstruct. Okay, thank you.